As we're getting set up, I again want to thank the organizers. I'd say this is one of the most uh, thoughtfully organized events I've ever participated in, in terms of thinking about the agenda, discussing it, uh, logistics, uh, and the like. So uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. So um, I'm, I'm going to try to be a little provocative and a little bit of background. I think my task was to think about interventions to um, more generally around misinformation, uh, but I'd like to I'd like to give some background first and then, and then talk about, sort of give a framing around information and misinformation and hopefully then get to some framework for solutions. Um, so first, a little background. It seems like this is, this is time series data where people were asked some very basic scientific questions, is light faster than sound, that kind of thing. And this is the percent of respondents scoring at least 70% on this sort of civic science lit. This is um, uh, in, uh, from a series of, uh, of, uh, of surveys, part by the NSF and the like. And actually, things seem to be trending in a good direction. If you're looking in the 80s and 90s, we would had, let's say, a 10% passage rate whereas now it's nearing uh, 30%. Um, you know, interestingly, we don't really actually have something similar or misinformation. You could be both more informed and misinformed. Um, and, and we don't know, actually. Uh, even things like uh, fluoridation, actually, there don't seem to be, to my surprise, great time series data on. Um, if we look internationally, we're sort of middling above average um, in, in science, uh, for example, on, on international tests. Someone has to be middling, I suppose. Uh, this this uh, doesn't bother me one way or the other. Um, where do we get scientific knowledge? Um, if you do surveys, uh, thank you, Pew, um, you know, news outlets, uh, general news outlets uh, seem to uh, dominate where people get news about the world, but, um, you know, uh, people don't have great, co tremendous confidence in those news outlets. Uh, you know, then you have documentaries, science magazines, and so on. I'll talk a little later about Google uh, and the like. Um, confidence in science eh, has been actually pretty steady. Uh, this is from the GSS. Our own, um, that um, that uh, scientific community has been steady around 40 something percent in terms of, of um, expression of confidence. Uh, medicine trending downwards, uh, but you know not too bad, especially when you put it in the context of other things. I won't even put politicians and Congress and president up there. Um, you know, military has done quite well. The media and press have actually. Uh, cratered in terms of public confidence. That's especially a partisan uh, split, um, and uh, which is important because, as I, as I just discussed, a lot of what we know about science is mediated uh, through the media. Um, so, why do we care? As 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 we discussed earlier, in part, they're decisions of public consequence. Let's say. A, policy preferences and voting around climate change, and decisions of private consequence, for example, around medical uh, decision. And those, those have, I think, different implications for how we get information. Uh, I'll, I'll note, and I'll state the obvious here, but like it's really important sometimes to state the obvious, is that almost all knowledge of shared interest is mediated. We don't observe science. Even scientists don't observe most science. Um, and so we need to think about, I mean, there's very little we know from direct experience, right? We, we um, uh, you know, um, e even we may it may be mediated by scientific journals, but um, but even for most of us, for what we know about general science, we're not reading all the science out there. For scientists in their niche, there's this very complex. In, you know, intramural mediation process. You collect the data. You might have people in your lab. Blah blah blah. It goes out for peer review. Blah etc. Back and forth. Um, for for citizens, it's rather different. It might be people talk to each other. They read the newspaper. They Google it. They talk to their doctor. This is us most of the time. I know, vast majority of the time. Like you know, we have our tiny niches which cover like 0.001% of all knowledge, where we have maybe some direct experience, and then 99 plus percent of the time, this is us. Um, that mediation process varies. So like, let's say we look through K through 12. Uh, if we look at health, there's not much uh, health education in K through 12. There's a ton of science curriculum. Um, but then ironically, when you become an adult, there are all these institutions to give you personalized information about health, right? You go see the doctor, they talk to you, et cetera. And there is no, very few people have their personal science, science advisor. So these kinds of processes for science, uh, mediation of science and health uh, information differ tremendously by domain, uh, health and general science uh, being one way of dividing it. And, and it's consequential. Let me ask people, how many of you have a family member 
who is a doctor and who you might call for advice given certain kinds of situations. Raise, raise your hand. That's a lot of hands. Not everyone, but it's a lot of hands. That's not typical. It's unsurprising. This is not a typical <laughs> population. And, and it's consequential. There's a wonderful paper, and you know, it's not through, fully through the peer review process, but it's really interesting, in the NBER, uh, which looks at um, uses a lottery system from Sweden to look at, uh, to get some causal leverage on the question of what's the impact of having family members uh, who, are doctor, who are doctors. And they're like huge effects, right? Um, uh, people, uh, after an applicant's matriculation, older relatives are, are substantially less likely to have heart attacks, they're more likely to adhere to medication regimes. Uh, adolescents are 20% more likely to be vaccinated uh, uh, for HPV, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this is like, Pretty cool causal study, right? Like we'll see if it survives through uh, through its own peer review process. But um, but you know I think this accords with what we know generally from networks that being near people who know uh, have high quality information is consequential, and this is like really consequential for for individuals, and that is part of this mediation process. Of course, the mediation process has changed, right? The internet has changed a lot. Even how we get information from the media and get there has changed. Uh, and you know, what the list can go on and on. Um, and, um, and I think when we think about it, I'm going to give a particular definition that slightly differs from the earlier one today. Uh, the definition I'm giving is information inconsistent with the scientific epistemic consensus. And, uh, and the, it's mostly the same. The one difference is I'm not really including intent in there because it's really hard to glean intent. It's really about the information. If the information is wrong, it's misinformation. We don't have to know the intent of the person circulating it. Um, this does not equal uninformed or untrue. It could be that science has come to a conclusion that is wrong, right? We, that used to be hormone replacement for, for women uh, later in life in order to reduce breast cancer uh, uh, risks. Well, that was wrong. It wasn't scientifically wrong, because that was the best science at the time, but it wasn't, there hadn't been really the best science done in a, uh, an RCT, and when an RCT was done, they're like, oh my gosh, we got the causation wrong, and it's actually the opposite of what we said, never mind, everyone, uh, and, uh, but that wasn't scientific, that wasn't misinformation. Um, okay, processes of misinformation, three processes I want to talk about, fake science and oblivious mediation, incompetent mediation, and corrupted scientific mediation. So you go to the internet, the truth about cancer is one of these, uh, you know, really awful websites that has a lot, that talks about the value of apricot kernels, right, um, to prevent uh, cancer, right, and not true, I hope that sticks with you, uh, maybe I should have said that first, and, um, and, um, you know, if you go search for cancer apricot seeds uh, on Google, um, you get, actually, this is a lot better than it used to be. I think uh, they're improving, but you get actually a website that seems to have proper information, but they, what they do, what Google does is pull out the, the first few sentences from that website. It's from Medical News Today. Um, and then that article in Medical News Today gives a summary of the assertion, and then they go and debunk it. So what, what uh, Google does is just pull out the summary of the assertion that apricot seeds um, um, will cure cancer, right? And they don't have the debunking. Uh, and, then, um, and then, interestingly, you'll see uh, ads on the side. Amazon is advertising for this. Um, and indeed, actually, Amazon on the bottom has apricot seeds cancer. Uh, as part of the advertising, because they're targeting people who, for this misinformation. And then Google suggests more searches, and you go to those searches, you just get entirely misinformation. You get all these YouTube videos, apricot kernels kill cancer cells, seeds cured as cancer, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's all this misinformation that you readily get sucked into. Uh, and then you get, and then you can even see on WebMD, which is a totally legit um, website, um, personal testimonials about um, about how apricot seeds uh, will cure cancer, and the truth about cancer is the source of all of this. Um, and then if you go to the Amazon website, by the way, you can see all these, again, testimonials. So what Amazon has done is that they advertise targeted at this on Google, which is then serving it up, which is then serving you, sending you down the rabbit hole, and then interestingly selling you, having testimonials on the website to sell you um, uh, uh, the stuff. You, you see similar stuff on, um, on YouTube, uh, where you, you know, actually YouTube, again, has gotten much better. If you search for vaccines, you don't get the crazy stuff, but then you get the autocompletes, and you go through the autocompletes, and you quickly get to vaccines cause autism. And like that, these are all the top searches, again, to highlight this. So what results? 
well, there's an interesting question in causation here, but, for, but we do definitely see these clusters of uh, non-vaccinated minors and outbreaks of measles. measles. We see inept mediation, um, and, I, and I think there are many examples in the media. Almost every nutrition story, I think, is misinformation. Here's the, the poor egg, um, uh, much maligned, and there's this um, new story, eating three or more eggs a week increases risk of heart disease and early death, a study says. By the way, headlines are a special form of misinformation, like I think all headlines should be disbelieved. And this is just false, right? And, but it's interesting, you read the study, and they do say the study findings are, uh, are observational, cannot obs uh, uh, establish causality, but then much of the rest of the study talks like it's all causal and says we should, uh, we should be talking about chasing gu guidelines. So no wonder the media gets confused, because the sciences are obscuring the, the assertions here. Corrupted mediation, uh, I think um, these are purposive efforts to disseminate misinformation. I think um, the, the biggest example is really the opioid crisis. Um, and if we look at um, the spread of OxyContin, um, it's very clear that there was clinical evidence uh, that Purdue Pharmaceuticals had uh, about the addictiveness. They specifically instructed um, that, uh, that to make physicians think the drug is stronger uh, let's see, it would be extremely dangerous at this early stage in the life of the product to make physicians think the drug is stronger or equal to morphine. We're well, well of, uh, aware of this view held by many physicians that actually uh, codone uh, is weaker than morphine. Not true. I do not plan to do anything about that. I agree with you, uh, Tackler uh, responded. Is there a general agreement or are, we, are there some holdouts? It's very clear that there was clinical evidence that Purdue had, that they purposely obscured that when they told doctors in terms of the dangers um, of, of the drug, um, and that um, part of the result is that we've had a massive increase in overdoses and, and deaths um, uh, due to um, opioids. So, and, and on the order of hundreds of thousands, so like for vaccines, we're talking about uh, order 10. For the corrupted science, I'd say it's on order of 100,000 or more. And so this, this is where the big deal is. So quickly, uh, and I, I wish I, I, I uh, had spoken faster, good news, people can be influenced by corrections, and I think Brendan uh, covered that. It's tricky, but it's doable. Most important is that I think from what I've said is the, to improve the mediation processes within the scientific industrial complex. Uh, we need to make uh, people more discriminating consumers of information. I have question marks here because I don't think we know exactly how well this will work. Improve media reporting on science, change the emphasis of internet platforms to quality of information. Um, and I, I'll have an example here on Google, which I'm going to skip. Uh, the challenge here, of course, in many of these cases is that may not be in the economic interests of the media, of, of, um, of the platforms, uh, and of the pharmaceutical companies in this case to do these things. And so that, that is a challenge. So hopefully that's some food for thought. Thank you.